The north of England is a grey, dreary place. I know from first-hand experience. I've lived there my entire life. It's often wet, cold, cloudy, with the inevitable forecast of more rain. When it comes to aviation, there are a number of airports scattered about the landscape in northern England. Our story today brings us down to the airport that serves one of the major cities here, Leeds. On May 24th, 1995, there was a plane crash, an airliner, that came down just a few miles out from Leeds Bradford Airport. It was a deadly accident that killed everyone on board. But likely, you've never heard of it. This video was a request from a viewer, also a local to the area. It's one of those accidents that time seemed to forget, as it were. So let's unpack this tragedy, because what we'll soon uncover is how the weather of the region left the pilots blind following the loss of a critical instrument. British regional airline Nightair was a short-lived airline in the 1990s based out of Leeds Bradford. They flew a small plane to various places in the UK. One of their routes was Leeds to Aberdeen in Scotland, which was performed twice per day, once in the morning and again in the afternoon. On May 24, 1995, their morning round-trip flight to Aberdeen was completed without issue. The pilots on that flight noted the plane and its cockpit instruments were in a serviceable condition. The plane stayed on the ground in Leeds for hours, most of the day in fact. In that time, the plane was pulled aside for routine maintenance before being positioned at the terminal ready for the later flight. The plane that Nightair operated was a Brazilian manufactured Embraer 110 Bandeirante, a small turboprop capable of carrying just 18 passengers. The small regional plane was popular as over 500 of these planes were produced, many of them still flying today, serving various types of roles. That afternoon, two pilots turned up to take the Night Air Embraer 110 to Aberdeen. 49-year-old Captain John Casson had been flying the 110 for just two years. His flying experience dated all the way back to 1972, and for most of his flying career, mainly flew small general aviation planes. He only gained his airline pilot's license in 1994, one year before the accident. In all, he had around 3,200 fly hours behind him. His first officer was much younger. 29-year-old Paul Denton had just a total of 300 fly hours to his name. Just 46 of those were in this plane. He was just starting out his flying career. A local to Yorkshire, he had achieved his PPL license just three years before the accident. Curiously, even despite the low flight hours, he had fully trained as a captain with night air and was waiting for a vacancy to become available. The weather that day was poor. You could even say it was the stereotypical British weather. Visibility was just over one kilometer. There was a cloud base of just 400 feet with thick cloud layers on top of that. There were thunderstorms in the forecast and it was raining. Of course it was. While we're on the subject of the weather, and sort of tangential to our discussion today, Leeds Bradford Airport has an interesting quirk. Many airports, including several of those in the United Kingdom, were built to exploit the regional prevailing winds. So many airports in this region have a runway orientation running in some variation from northeast to southwest. Leeds was built different. Their runway has an orientation that completely goes against this unwritten rule. However, to add a bit more context and history here, the airport actually used to have three runways. Two have since been converted into taxiways, with the one larger runway servicing the airport, which happened to be this one. What this means is that because of this windy quirk, crosswinds are common. In fact, Leeds Bradford is the local media's go-to place for those stormy crosswind landing shots. Although that day in 1995 was a particularly good day for Leeds Bradford, winds were recorded to have been coming from the southeast. So Night Air Flight 816 
would make a departure to the south, where they were then expected to make a left-hand turn to make for a northerly heading towards Scotland. 5.40 in the evening. The two pilots called the tower for startup. On board, including the two pilots, were nine passengers and one flight attendant, for a total of 12 people on board. Clearance was given for the plane to be positioned onto runway 14. They backtracked the runway and received clearance for takeoff, followed by a routing instruction for once they were in the air. The weather outside, though, was getting worse. 547, Night Air Flight 816 left the runway. As expected, the plane flew the runway heading before making a left turn heading north. According to the ATC transcript, there were no communications between the plane and the tower during this time. Their next contact would come less than two minutes into the flight, when Flight 816 radioed back the following message. Nightway 816, we've got a problem with the artificial horizon, and we'd like to come back. This message is key in understanding what happened. When the pilots made this transmission, they would have had no idea that in less than three minutes, they'd be dead. First of all, what is the artificial horizon? We've talked about it before, but it's worth a recap. The artificial horizon, also known as the attitude direction indicator, is one of the most basic of flight deck instruments. It's this thing, a gyroscopic instrument that displays roll and pitch. Looking at it, even if you are not a pilot, you can probably easily understand this instrument. The plane symbol in the center remains stationary, whilst the background moves. As mentioned, it is connected to a gyroscope that feeds pitch and roll axis information to the attitude display. Both pilots should have one of these instruments each. These days, commercial planes have a third or maybe even a fourth artificial horizon in case of one or multiple failures. Regulations in Britain at the time simply demanded that there be two of these instruments, one for each pilot. There was no requirement, on this plane at least, for a third backup instrument. The accident plane, therefore, only had the two. When investigators later retrieved the two indicators, they appeared to function, but gave different readings. When the problem with the attitude indicator was noted on the radio, it is believed there was a failure of the captain's side instrument. The investigation strongly believing that there was just one failure of the attitude indicators. However, the possibility of dual failure was never ruled out. Although the report highlights a figure that suggests the probability of this happening was one in a trillion. Process of elimination into what caused this failure leads to possible electrical interruption with the instrument. If the indicator and its gyro doesn't get the necessary power, it can display erratic readings, which is what happened here. So continuing on with the flight, the failure of this critical instrument prompted Captain John Casson to make the return to Leeds. Even though it is strongly believed that there was a failure of just one attitude instrument from the investigator's point of view, it was clear that the pilots doubted their one functioning instrument. Using the controller's radar, they would ask if they were flying straight. Remember the weather conditions we mentioned a little while ago. At just a few thousand feet, the plane was stuck in the thick of the cloud. They couldn't see a thing outside. It would appear the weather left them blind. All they could see was clouds. Doubting their instruments and without any horizon outside, they relied on the controller's radar to assure them that they were flying straight. Are we flying straight? Was a question asked to the controller at multiple points during this short flight. Secondary radar data showed the plane making an additional turn to the left, heading northwest, before a sharp turn to the right, heading south. First Officer Paul Denton would then make the final transmission from the plane. Any reports of the tops, sir? referring to the tops of the cloud. The aircraft continued to climb through 3,000 feet, reaching a maximum altitude of 3,600. As it turned out, there happened to be another plane taking off from Leeds, and the controller requested that this plane report the cloud tops. Not that this would be much help to the occupants of Flight 816, because the flight had entered its endgame. 
From the controller's perspective, tracking the plane on radar, the aircraft vanished. Unbeknownst to the pilots, the plane had drifted into a left bank. Confused, lost in the cloud, and doubting their instruments, the plane entered a steep left overbank, where the nose dropped, and the aircraft entered a rapid descent. At this moment, the pilots lost control of the plane. Moments later, residents in the nearby Yorkshire village of Dunkeswick noticed the sound of airplane engines, followed by an explosion. Other witnesses to the disaster confirmed that there was an in-flight breakup shortly before impact with the ground. In the rapid descent, the aircraft exceeded its structural limits. The right wing as well as the right horizontal stabilizer broke away. Seconds later, the remains of the aircraft crashed into the English countryside, leading to the deaths of all 12 people on the plane. They were killed instantly. The investigation that followed concluded that even despite the failure of the captain's artificial horizon, the pilots still should have been able to navigate with other instruments. The plane was not fitted with a cockpit voice recorder. Again, regulations at the time didn't demand it. Aside from the ATC communications, we don't know what happened between the two men on the flight deck. In their report, investigators recommended that a third artificial horizon be fitted on commercial planes, if not already present, and require all those instruments to be brought up to a high standard. They would go on further to recommend that all commercial planes be fitted with a cockpit voice recorder. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to be subscribed as there are new videos every Saturday. This one was actually the second of two videos this week. If you missed it, we did put one out on Wednesday evening as an extra midweek video. So it's been a busy week on my end and I think I'll be giving myself the day off after I record this outro segment. Special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon for their generous ongoing support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, a massive thanks to you. I really, really appreciate it. If you yourself would like to support the channel further and have your name featured up here on this list, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content, two days before it goes out publicly on YouTube. If you didn't know, I also have a personal Twitter page and that too will be linked in the pinned comment. And that is all for me today. I hope you have a great Saturday and weekend and I will see you next time. Goodbye.